Thank you, Ben. Senator, and indeed civic leaders, uh, we are very glad to be enjoying your hospitality today and greatly appreciated your thoughtful and profound remarks. Thank you for that. If there's any city community that knows about the harsh realities of interdependence, Berlin does. And I think all of us who know Berlin a little are repeatedly cheered and encouraged by the tremendous success the people of Berlin have made of this city with its very difficult past. It's a very powerful story. It's a wonderful place to be. Thank you very much indeed. The world watched with shock and horror as 9-11 occurred. The world realized that it brought home to the people of the US in particular the brutal reality of that world as it had become. The vision and determination of Ben and indeed his very remarkable wife Leah and others they involved to have forestalled a retreat into bitter American isolationism and take it as an opportunity for engagement with the world and to recognize its interdependence deserves the thanks and appreciation of us all. And I find it powerful and significant that his daughter has taken up the torch and is carrying it as a bit as energetically as they did before her. I was privileged to be at Philadelphia. It was quite soon, relatively speaking, after 9-11, and it was at the beginning of the age of Bush. And there was a lot of anxiety, to put it mildly, in Europe about what we had in store. I came back from Philadelphia to my own country encouraged. And one of the things I said is we must never fall into the trap of stigmatizing the Americans by their current political leadership. Because in America, in Philadelphia, I met courageous, imaginative, good people who had every bit as much anxiety, if not more, about what the Bush era would involve as any of us in Europe. Now, this past few days, we've seen how this idea has prospered and it's been for me as an older man a real regenerative experience to be with the younger generation as they've been having their exciting discussions together. And as I said this morning, what has impressed me is their open-mindedness and their absence of prejudice and their desire to find the truth and the real answers to the challenges that face us. Last night, we were brilliantly reminded that while thousands of people in New York died and many more thousands were bereaved as a result of what happened, sadly, in the years since then, tens, even hundreds of thousands of people, innocent people, have died in Iraq, Afghanistan, and currently in the floods of Pakistan. Ongoing, the ongoing suffering and oppression of ordinary people in the Middle East, in the North Caucasus and Chechnya, and in places like Burma, are a reality every bit as challenging and stark as what happened at 9-11. The real threat to global security and stability, I believe, is the presence of a majority of the world's population who feel totally excluded from political influence and political involvement. 
While that continues, there will always be the potential of a recruiting ground for extremists. Some people were very disappointed by Copenhagen on the dreadful issue of the overpowering, overwhelming issue of climate change. I don't want to be smug, but I wasn't altogether surprised. Because the question that had worried me was who owned the agenda that was being addressed in Copenhagen? Was it the agenda of the majority of the world's population to which solutions were being found? Or was it the agenda of the powerful, however enlightened, who had articulated the problems as they saw them and were offering the solutions as they saw them and inviting the world to join in and to comment, perhaps to change it a bit at the edges. But there wasn't a sense that this agenda came from the majority, who after all frequently are facing the consequences of what the privileged majority have done to the world's climate. I keep reflecting that across the world there are millions of people who are not only helpless but are fed up and amongst them some very well educated, very highly intelligent people who are very fed up with constantly being told what they must do to ensure the survival of the world and what must be demanded of them. It seems to me that the first challenge, therefore, is to try and empower constantly more people in the world community. It seems to me that we have to develop, enable a sense of identity to develop culturally and in every other way. And from that standpoint, it seems to me that it's been unfortunate that sometimes it's suggestion that there is a contradiction between localism and globalism. I believe there's no such contradiction. I believe that effective, strong globalism will be built upon strong localism producing identify a people with a sense of identity, a sense of significance, a sense of, of, of confidence in, able, in which, which enables them to speak out. I just leave these last couple of thoughts with you. Diversity is sometimes presented, and not least in Germany, as a, a problem to be managed. It would be very foolish to suppose there aren't very real political issues to be handled. And our friends in Germany are grappling very much with just those issues now. But I also believe that diversity is a wonderful illustration of the potential of humanity and the living world. Diversity is what makes the living world worth having. It's something to be celebrated, not to be suppressed. And the challenge is to find ways to enable people to celebrate their diversity, to find their identity and their own ethnic origins and traditions, and come together to build a strong global community. That's the challenge, how we bring the two together. This means that peace, if we're to have it in its fullest sense, must always be inclusive and not exclusive. We can't manage peace. We can't impose peace. We have to build peace from the bottom upwards. Certainly in my own country, the United Kingdom, we learnt this. We learnt that peace, if you're to have it, if there's to be any chance of having it, means being inclusive and talking to people with whom it's very difficult to talk. We only began to make significant progress in Northern Ireland when we realised we had to talk to the political representatives of the IRA. And to keep delaying this only delayed the process of peace building altogether. And therefore, there aren't shortcuts. They have to have an exclusive approach. There's been reference by Ben to my stewardship at Oxfam. I had, would say that probably when I was director of Oxfam, it was the most exciting period of my life. I want to tell you just one little story. Oh, it was a powerful story at the time. I went 
to Mozambique in the middle of that terrible civil war in the 80s. I got to my destination only by the courtesy and friendship of a relief team who were flying in in the very dangerous situation. And they really were courageous crew who took their plane with relief supplies in. When I arrived, there was a great open space. And I can still hear it, it still haunts me, the murmuring of the crowd. And there were people there who'd lost everything. Some were naked. I talked to a family which had got there a few hours before I arrived, who'd walked for several days and had seen their home burnt to the ground and their seven-year-old child chopped to death and thrown into their home to be burnt in their home. Now what impressed me was that within days of those people coming there, they were not asking for seed or for clothing or for food. Sorry, they were not asking for food and for clothing. They were asking for seed and tools with which to start growing their own food again. And I remember thinking, what a privilege to be working with people of this courage and resilience. I must go home and say to people at home, they don't depend on us. It's our privilege to be working with them. They're the kind of people who can generate the future of the world. But there was another question that formed in my mind, and frankly, you may all say, well, oh, there went another it had a good deal to, with my, to do with my decision to return to politics in the more conventional sense. I said to myself, what kind of charlatan would I be if I went back and described to the people at home what I've seen and what I've learned from this experience and failed to ask the question, why? Why is this happening? How do we overcome the causes of these issues? Not just respond to the challenges of the issues, but overcome the causes. And I believe the hallmark of civilization is the refusal to stop asking the question why and to keep the search going all the time for the underlying causes so that we can address the solutions and not get caught up in palliative action which probably becomes counterproductive. No, friends, we talk to the poor of the world, we talk about them, but how often do we talk with them and listen to them and become with them their advocates? I believe that interdependence is not the objective it's the reality of the situation in which we find ourselves. I believe the spirit with which we must tackle that and find the solutions depends upon rediscovering the spirit of solidarity. Because unless there is solidarity in humankind across the globe, we shall never have a future.